Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, sovereign wealth funds. This is where the big bucks lie, but the world's second largest fund, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, is shutting up shop in London. It says it's still committed to UK investments, but is there more to the move than meets the eye? Also this week, the IMF chief Christine Lagarde says Gulf countries need to act now to diversify their income and deal with the reality of lower oil prices. And we look at one country in Europe where an attempt to boost the government's coffers has led to protests and a threat of outright disobedience. It is not often we delve into the world of sovereign wealth funds, but it appears something's going on between the world's second largest such fund and its longtime partner, the United Kingdom, which warrants a second look. We're talking about ADIA, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which is strangely planning to close its office in London, the place it was founded back in the late 1960s. Now, the company's issued a statement saying the decision won't impact its investments or its commitment to the UK. But there are also persistent claims that the UAE has been trying to use its financial clout to influence British foreign policy. Central to the claims are reports the UAE government promised Britain a $9 billion arms contract if Prime Minister David Cameron ordered a clampdown on the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, it's fair to say Gulf countries have recently been more vocal, shall we say, in projecting their own interests abroad. Last month, Saudi Arabia's ambassador to Britain reacted to public criticism from the opposition leader, Jeremy Corbyn, by saying his country would not be lectured by anyone and that trade links could be threatened. All this at a time when the British government is actually trying to attract sovereign wealth investment for its large-scale infrastructure projects. So that sets out our story. This is just how much money and investment we're talking about. ADA, as we said, the second largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, estimated assets worth $773 billion. Many of those billions tied up in Britain, and indeed Europe as a whole makes up between 20 and 35% of its asset allocation. ADIA doesn't reveal specific holdings, but we know it recently bought a stake in Angel Trains, one of the UK's rolling stock owners. Uh, it also has stakes in the parent company of infrastructure assets like Gatwick Airport and Thames Water. And when you throw in the rest of the UAE sovereign wealth funds, of course Abu Dhabi is not the only one, the Emirates have total assets under management of more than a trillion dollars, including things like Manchester City Football Club and the Lanesborough Hotel in London. Well, Dr. Sarah Bazubandi is with us this week to discuss this. She is a lecturer in international political economy at Regents University, London. Uh, Dr. Bazubandi, thank you for joining us. When that news came out that ADIA was shutting down its, its London office, which, as I said, was actually founded in London, or its predecessor was founded back in the late 60s, what did you think of that? Didn't it seem a little odd that an investment fund with so much tied up in London wanted to shut down its office? It, yeah, it is not necessarily focused uh, in, in one country necessarily. The reason for presence of ADI is the importance of London as a financial hub. It doesn't reflect the weight of investment of ADIA in uh, the city of London or, or in across the United Kingdom. Um, of course, uh, ADIA has a fairly diverse portfolio of investment across various uh, geographic zones, including the European continent and most of the um, European operations, I would imagine, would have been uh, managed through London office. So in that sense, um, it's not um, necessarily reflecting a f an outflow of capital from the United Kingdom by ADIA, uh, as much as it's very much a reflection of um, limitation of most of the European operations perhaps in the long run that could be a sign of a longer term strategy by idea do, do you have any thoughts though and, and, and I know we can <coughs> excuse me we can speculate all we want uh, but about pressure between the two governments over issues like Muslim Brotherhood <coughs> excuse me the um, arms deals as well in your research and in your knowledge what is the relationship like between Westminster and Abu Dhabi um, of course, n UAE and most of the countries across the Gulf has been, uh, have been um, close um, partners of the United Kingdom, uh, not necessarily just in the um, um, 
military and arm and uh, defense relationship, but also in political and strategic alliances. Uh, the UK has a um, long-standing relationship which goes back beyond the establishment of most of these countries across the Persian Gulf um, uh, with, with, the, with the countries and with the elite and political elite and the ruling families. Um, of course, that this general situation across the region and specifically in the light of recent events in Europe has become quite difficult in the sense that uh, it's um, a, a very tough environment for uh, maintaining those previous links because uh, there are now multiple overlapping interests and often perhaps conflict of interest. Mm. Um, it, Again, um, I would like to uh, repeat myself that this doesn't necessarily uh, reflect that a complete collapse of relationship between the United Kingdom uh, and the UAE or any other um, Gulf countries for that matter, but it shows that the complication of the environment is very much affecting the strategic, financial, economic uh, and political decision making on each side. Mm. There's an, I, I feel there's an interesting balance to strike here because funds like Adia, and you've got the other UAE ones, and you've got the Qatari ones and the Saudi ones. Uh, they have invested so heavily in the United Kingdom, and it feels like there can be some sort of, well, resentment sometimes that they buy up all this prime property in these locations. But by the same token, the UK will obviously be looking for as much capital injection as it can get from these places. Absolutely, that's, that's correct. Uh, but closing down of um, an office, um, however early it might uh, be materialized, it doesn't mean that all these assets are very liquid and they can be transferred in a very short span of time. Um, and the other question is, um, at the moment, under the current global economic environment, what is the alternative for um, ADIA and um, Emirates government uh, to divert these um, assets towards? If not the United Kingdom and if not London, then that's a question of uh, where to move these assets mm. to. So um, again, um, I, I wouldn't imagine this is something that can happen very quickly and um, I wouldn't imagine that there are a lot of alternatives uh, that ultimately uh, would host these assets. Um, to me, um, such moves and maneuvers um, seem more strategically or perhaps geopolitically motivated. Mm. In order to achieve um, a certain um, request or a certain demand or, or in order to push pressure on the other party to, to get um, maybe even non-commercial um, demands from, from uh, the UK government that might be um, a concern for the, the Emirates. Just finally, Sarah, and I'm speaking more broadly here about sovereign wealth funds here in the Gulf. This is a very key time for them, isn't it? They have got to get used to these lower oil prices. They've gone down, they're staying down, they don't look like they'll be recovering anytime soon. The money has got to be used wisely, doesn't it? Or even more wisely than, than previously. We know that uh, at the moment the markets, um, the crude oil markets are not really expecting much higher prices than we see mm. uh, today or perhaps they're going to either stabilize at this level or even if there are changes it's going to be um, a further slightly decline of the prices. So um, the, the time of three digit prices, mm. 100 per $100 per barrel uh, price of oil is probably behind us mm. for the time being. Um, as a result, it means that um, not only the governments of the oil-rich countries do not have the same opportunity for accumulating these assets as they did have previously over the past decade or so, but also they are going to require to repatriate some of these assets uh, in order to maintain certain expenses at home. Um, 
exactly like Saudi Arabian government had to do a few months ago. Mm. They needed to bring $70 uh, billion dollars worth of their assets, which was nearly 10% of the total um, Saudi Arabian monetary agency under management, asset under management. Um, so it shows that um, economic and financial pressure are also, domestic economic and financial pressure, of course, are also a factor for consideration. Um, and these are um, s funds that have served uh, various purposes and they had multiple purposes over the uh, time since the establishment. And still ahead on counting the cost, could this flag be about to change? New Zealanders have started a long and expensive process that may see it reject its national symbol. A lot of what we looked at in the first part of the show was essentially about spending. Whether there are political issues or not, these funds and the states which back them are out there to spend. But the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, has warned the Gulf states they need to rein in their spending and start looking at ways other than oil and gas to bring in money. She recently spoke to Al Jazeera's Martin Dennis. My message was this is not an alarm, but it's an alert bell that we are ringing. The price of oil has uh, sharply declined in the last uh, 12 months, and uh, we do not see, based on the future, uh, in, uh, in the market of, of the futures, based on uh, the sort of basic analysis of supply and demand, we do not see a significant improvement in the near term. So as a result of that new reality, we believe that finance ministers and authorities should actually take steps in the spending side of their budget, in the revenue side of their budget. And they should also uh, welcome private sector operators in order to create growth from alternative sources. And uh, among your recommendations has been the imposition of a, a value-added tax, not just on in individual countries, but across the GCC region. How has this been received? The introduction in the GCC uh, countries of a VAT at a small uh, percentage point uh, was actually discussed by the ministers themselves back in May. Uh, and we certainly put a bit of uh, research and analysis into it. And we believe that it's a good opportunity to put in place on a regional basis a small VAT uh, in order to rebalance the sources of revenue. When you have much lower revenue coming out of uh, oil and gas, you need to find alternative sources. Sure, and VAT they, is a good one. They've got to balance their books, and I think that is a realization that is now uh, being realized, that is now yeah. manifesting itself across the region. But um, I'm particularly interested in your message regarding Saudi Arabia, where you have said that within the space of five years, reserves could be gone through, they could be depleted. This sounds like an urgent situation, not just a, an alert. This sounds like an alarm bell ringing. It is an alert, not an alarm, because all these countries, including Saudi Arabia, are starting from a position of strength where they have significant buffers accumulated over the last uh, few years, and they can actually use those resources, either by putting them to use uh, against their deficit numbers, or by leveraging them in order to borrow. But if countries do nothing, and assuming the price of oil was to stay at the level where it is, then certainly reserves would be depleted promptly, and more promptly than one would imagine, because it, it, it actually shrinks quickly. So our estimates are based on no alternative policies, no measures being taken, and the price of oil remaining very low, or remaining low. Given that this is quite a new message for this region, despite the realization that does seem to be seeping in, in, into the collective mind, I know that Qatar has certainly uh, made, made steps in that direction. Mm -hmm. The UAE has also addressed the issue, for instance, of subsidies. Yes. Subsidies is a massive issue, isn't it? Saudi Arabia spends more than 13% of its GDP on subsidies. Qatar, I think, imposes the highest per capita uh, uh, subsidy in the world, something like $6,000 per head. Is this something that you think these countries politically are prepared to move on? We would certainly hope that the authorities are prepared to address 
those issues and to address um, uh, the political um, difficulty of communicating to the public opinions that that situation cannot endure. And that whether it's uh, subsidies, whether it's setting the right price, uh, whether it's on uh, fossil energy, or whether it's on water, for instance, those uh, items have to be um, looked at, right price set, and subsidies gradually over time phased out with the adequate level of protection for the people in need. So it's not a question of removing brutally the subsidies and having everybody you know, take the brunt of it. I think when it is done successfully, as we have seen in other countries in the world, you protect the poorest, those in need, the lower middle class, for instance, up to that level. But above that, prices need to be uh, looked at. Well, we've got regular contributor Jan Randolph with us this week to expand more on what the Gulf nations need to do for their economies. He is Director of Sovereign Risk at IHS in London. Jan, I have lived in the Gulf in 10 years. I've seen all the building and the investment that's gone on in that time. And I must admit, I've often wondered, I hope they're saving something for a rainy day here, because if it's not rainy yet, then it feels like the clouds are gathering. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, I think so. Um, I also think you know, the Gulf countries have been here before. Uh, and it's interesting, we are now living in a world with the end of the energy and commodity super cycle, mainly because China's slowing and China's taking the wind out of the sail, sails for demand when it comes to oil and commodities. And we're seeing weakness everywhere in pricing and in demand and in growth from Russia to Brazil, but also the GCC. Uh, but the GCC, generally speaking, has built up financial fat during mm. the uh, boom years, more so than, for example, others uh, in, in the CIS region, for example. Right. I, you know, I like the phrase that you but said. Adjustments that, are taking place. Sorry to interrupt you, Jan. I like the phrase that you said there of energy super cycle. Can you just explain that to us a little bit more, please? Well, there's been we, the, the big, big development over the last 20, 30 years has been China coming on board the global economy in a very big way, uh, supporting global growth. But also we saw a tremendous increase in commodity prices, including mm. energy and oil. Uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, but that's now coming to an end because China is rebalancing its own economy. It's mm. got its own debt problems it has to deal with. Mm. And it's slowing. And so the demand that China has provided is, is, means that the wind in the sales for commodity markets has been taken out, um, which, means, which explains largely why energy prices have fallen from over $100 a barrel to well under 50 now. And are likely to remain there for the next few years uh, because China is going to go on a slower growth path uh, as it diversifies its own economy uh, and moves, shifts its uh, growth drivers more to consumption rather than investment, which is heavy, heavy commodity intensive. So from the Gulf perspective, the, the GCC perspective, is there now an opportunity to sort of really look at how these economies function and possibly to look at changes? You know, Christine Lagarde earlier talked about maybe the introduction of taxes, things like VAT. We know how heavily subsidized life is in the Gulf. Is it time to reassess these things? There's, there's two, two, two dimensions here. There's a short term, and she's urged fiscal consolidation. Uh, and there's the underlying longer term, diversification, which is structural. And that's always been the case for uh, the Gulf countries, structural, diversification of the economies. Uh, Dubai's obviously gone into services. But Abu Dhabi, for example, has tried to uh, go into the uh, more frontier industries, um, technologies. So they've all attempted that. But in the short term, we're seeing uh, something like $275 billion less export revenues from energy this year compared to last year. We're seeing current account surpluses weaken, even disappear. We're seeing fiscal surpluses disappear, moving into deficit. And that means immediately the urgency of fiscal consolidation. And that means a number of things. It means increasing non-oil-based taxes, like VAT you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, broadening, broadening the tax net. But also it means fiscal consolidation on the other side, looking at energy subsidies more carefully, uh, withdrawing them, bringing energy subsidies more into line with world market prices. We know energy is heavily subsidized in the GCC. But it also means reviewing capital expenditure plans uh, and keeping a control on wage costs. Those are the short-term issues. 
Uh, but the, un the, the longer term issues of re-engineering re your economies away from over-dependence on energy means developing non-oil uh, uh, industries and services. So we've talked about the idea of the Gulf countries introducing value-added tax, VAT as they call it, to perhaps diversify their incomes. But also, perhaps not surprisingly, VAT has proved one of the most unpopular ways for governments right around the world to raise revenues. And we're more so than in Greece, as John Seropoulos reports now from the island of Naxos. Cheese is Naxos' signature export. It's created an $11 million dairy industry, feeding hundreds of families. But farmers here are worried that they may now go out of business. A law passed last month abolishes a consumer tax discount for Greek islands, and Naxos is among the first to enforce it. I estimate that cattle feeds will go up by 14 points. Nobody here can make ends meet that way. My costs for feeds and medicines will go up by 500 or 600 euros a day. It may prove catastrophic because that means my total costs will go up by a fifth. Margaritis grows his own cornmeal, but he says it won't cover all his needs. And it's not just dairy farmers. Potatoes, another Naxos export, will suffer from a hike in fertilizer and seed costs. The farmers' cooperative says there's no room to raise prices or cut costs. It's very difficult for us to pay farmers more. And these are family businesses. Everyone is already pitching in. You can't cut salaries or fire people. I think people are just going to leave. Tourism doesn't offer a safe harbour either. With a 23% tax on ferry tickets and restaurants, people here fear that this industry will sink as visitors flee to countries with much lower tax. The tax discount was meant to compensate for distance. The cost of shipping goods to and from islands hurts profit margins. The islands have enjoyed their VAT discount for a quarter century. They are losing it when they need it most. They are now left defenseless against a series of VAT hikes being levied across the country. To them, it's a calamitous coincidence. Mayor Manolis Margaritis says municipal costs alone will go up by almost $3 million. He's bringing more islands into a class action lawsuit to challenge the tax hike in the Supreme Court and is prepared to go all the way to the European Court. Meanwhile, some here are preparing what they see as necessary disobedience. They will abandon their sheep and goats and find their own illegal ways to survive that won't put money in state coffers. They will smuggle their feed in by sea or cut down their herd. They operate on a simple equation. For the state to survive, they must survive. And for them to survive, they must cheat the state. Finally this week, something from home. My home. New Zealand has become the first country in the world to give its citizens the chance to change their national flag. These are our five options, the most popular of which will eventually be pitted against the current flag in a second vote. Will it be $17 million well spent? Carly Flynn has this report from Auckland. Who thinks that next year we should change New Zealand's flag? Interesting. For these primary school children on Auckland's North Shore, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Um, silver fern, black and white. Why? Um, because I think it represents like all blacks and stuff like that. But getting consensus for a new flag on a national level is more difficult. With New Zealand the way it is, there are a whole lot of other things that are more important um, than changing a flag. We just need to really focus on getting something that is instantly recognisable as a, as, a, as a New Zealand, as a Kiwi icon. We have moved a long way from our British uh, roots and it might be timely to change, but that's not what we're hearing the public say. The current New Zealand flag, the country's third, has been flying high for 113 years. Uh, it really stirs my heart and it's recognisable all around the world and I'm proud to put it on my backpack when I went away overseas. Prime Minister John Key says one of the biggest reasons to change the flag is because it's often confused with the Australian one. It's New Zealand's time, we're really coming out from under Australia's wing and, and that's why this debate has been so good, you know, and, and this is our chance now to say this is what we are, this is our new brand, we're not Little Australia. Twelve well-known New Zealanders picked four flag designs from over 10,000 submitted. A fifth option, dubbed Red Peak, was included after a petition on social media. Three of the designs have the iconic silver fern emblem. A popular choice in this school classroom, where the fern came out on top after a mock referendum. Um, I've chosen the 
black and blue silver fern one because the black goes with the silver fern and the blue just looks cool on it. New Zealand is one of only a handful of countries left in the world with the Union Jack still on its flag. The flag design that has the most votes will go against the current New Zealand flag in a second referendum in March next year. It's then the country will truly know which flag will represent it going forward, the old or the new. And love if you see Carly Flynn reporting for us on Counting the Cost. She's an old friend of mine, actually. Uh, that is it for this week's show, though. You can get more online at aljazeera.com slash ctc, which will take you straight to our page. Individual reports, links, and entire episodes, including the Dubai Air Show episode, to catch up on. You can also get in touch with us by tweeting me at KamalAJE, and please use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or just drop me an old email. Counting the Cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.